This is Shackleton, and this is Paul, and we're going to continue talking about the science of superstorms. So I'll just continue right where I left off in the last video. So the frequency, the severity, and the duration of extreme weather events is ramping up. Would the extreme weather events be torrential rains leading to flooding or to droughts? This is the bottom line. So did climate change cause the hurricane? It's the wrong question to ask. Did climate change cause an event? It's the wrong question to ask. Okay, we're undergoing abrupt climate change. We've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere and oceans. Therefore, all weather events that are occurring are happening in this different climate. So the statistics of weather has changed. The severity of events, where they occur, when they occur, and the type of events. This has all changed because we've turbocharged the climate. Let me talk about specific things that are key in the science of superstorms. What is different now from before? Why are these storms getting out of hand? The first thing is the sea surface temperature. You're probably aware of that. The temperature of the ocean water on the surface has to be greater than 26.5 degrees C, which is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, in order to have enough evaporation, enough energy to be transferred from the ocean to the atmosphere just above to trigger these tropical disturbances. When these disturbances, a lot, most of them in the Atlantic Basin form just to west of Africa, they move over warm water, they suck energy out of the ocean, and they become upgraded into hurricanes. As they proceed across warm water, they move up the scale, the, the, the uh, you know, category one, category two, etc. And uh, there's a lot of talk about having, adding an additional scale for um, things like water um, and storm surge and stuff. As long as there's no shear winds to break apart the storms. What a shear wind is, is it would be wind at different alt in different directions at different altitudes, and that would tend to inhibit the rotation of the storm. It would break apart the storms. Um, and also shear winds can bring in, if the winds are high, they can bring in a lot of dry air and also kind of quench the storm. But if they don't exist, then these storms can develop into massive storms. There's more water vapor. Uh, I get to that later. Okay, and it's, uh, the sea surface temperature in the Gulf of Mexico, where Harvey and the tropical is where Harvey, where the tropical disturbance first started. Remember, Harvey was just a Gulf of Mexico storm. Started in the Gulf of Mexico, went across short distance, and it did all this damage to uh, Texas. The tr the Gulf of Mexico was a few degrees warmer than normal. It's pushing 30, 31, 32. 86 to 89 Fahrenheit, like a sauna, the ideal temperature to breed these storms. In the case of Hurricane Florence, it was the Gulf Stream that was extremely warm. And we were kind of lucky. If you look at the temperature plots of the Gulf Stream, uh, you know, it was warmer. It was warm. It was warm, warm enough, but it wasn't, war it wasn't amplifying um, F Florence. Okay, Florence kind of maintain, you know, it was category four, then down to three, then down to two, you know, it was two when it hit. If it, had, you know, if that water had been, a, if it had been a little bit further south, not that far south, it would have probably maintained three or even, even higher, even four, because the water was a bit warmer there. So, you know, where as bad as these things are, they could be a lot worse. Remember uh, Irene last year, um, it was heading right for Palm Beach, Miami, and then it veered off and came came off came ashore on the in the Everglades from the uh, west coast of Florida instead of instead of buzzsawing the the east uh, coast you know hitting Miami and Palm Springs and stuff that would have been like trillion dollars damage perhaps anyway as hurricanes move across warm water they suck up energy from the surface and there's an upwelling of colder water to displace the evaporated water okay, and the warmer water, okay? There's a lot of churning in the ocean. It cools the surface of the temperature after the hurricane passes. Or if the hurricane's moving very, very slowly, it can kind of self-extinguish um, or at least not gain in strength. The problem is that the Gulf of Mexico, the water is very, very warm, very weak, uh, deep down. So it's not just sea surface temperature. The water underneath is warm. 
So as Harvey was moving across, it could gain strength. The temperature of the surface water in the wake of Harvey was still very, very strong. Now, if you look at the temperature in the wake of Florence, um, it had it actually you could it has noticeable drops, and you could also there were a lot of um, <coughs> CTD measurements, um, which is um, measurements of salinity and uh, ocean temperature uh, through the water column, and you could actually see the thermocline shift. You could see all that water being sucked out of the ocean down to uh, you know 50 meters, 100 meters even. Okay, so a key factor, the oceans, but the, why are the oceans so darn hot? They're absorbing 93% of the heat. Okay, so, 90, so when you talk about climate change or glo global warming, you know, the atmosphere is warming, sure, but 93% of the heat's actually warming the oceans. You know, we're not, so we're getting marine heat waves. You know, as humans living on the land, we're experiencing air temperatures and surface temperatures. What a lot of people don't realize is that the heating in the ocean causes the oceans to be much warmer, raises the air temperature. So we've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere with um, these greenhouse gases. We've also changed the chemistry of the oceans because all of that CO2 in the oceans is making the oceans acidic. So anyway, since the turn of the century, the previous century, we're uh, you know over a degree warmer in the air. We're setting trends every year in terms of warmth. During the El Nino year, uh, a couple of years ago, we had record high temperatures. Even the summer was record high, and it was like an El La Nina. So this is a very, there's a very simple, basic physical relation. When the air is warmer, it can hold more water vapor. Google Clausius Clapeyron relationship if you want. When the sea surface temperature is warmer, there's more evaporation. When there's more evaporation, the water vapor gets into the air. Because it's hotter than the surrounding air, it's buoyant, it rises up, you get convective lift. Water vapor condenses into clouds, into water droplets and clouds. All that energy is released when it condenses to fuel these massive storms. So they're much more intense. And when they're much more intense, they get much larger in size as well. For every degree Celsius, there's about 7% more water vapor in the atmosphere. This water vapor turbocharges the storms. That's why the extreme weather events we're seeing around the planet seem to be a lot more intense than they used to be. Another key factor is that these two things, sea surface and air temperature, are both increasing as a result of climate change, global warming, double whammy. Now back to Harvey, parts were over land, parts were over the ocean. The parts over the ocean were gaining strength. So the strength of Harvey was maintained when it was ashore, because it was only half ashore. It was sucking energy basically heat energy from the ocean, fire, and it was like a fire hydrant or conduit directing it from the surface of the ocean to the land over Texas near Houston. Another, now, the other key factor is that the storm guidance is changing. So there was an interesting study with Florence, an attribution study. It said, okay, if climate change, because, you know, what, here's what happened, here's what, how much water we expect um, to be rained out over... North Carolina, and if we didn't have climate change then, and global warming, then here's what we'd expect. And the answer is 50% more water um, with, because of climate change. But without climate change, that storm probably would, wouldn't have even hit there, right? Because the, the storm would have done its curve to the right. It wouldn't have had such an irregular path. So it's a bit of a, I'm, I hope they mentioned that in the study. I wasn't able to look at it directly. But the storm guidance is changing. This, this is the jet streams that circle the Earth. They normally pull storms along. Should be a capital on Earth. Whenever you write Earth, you know, we're not talking about soil. We're talking about the planet. So it should be capitalized. Just a small note here. <clears throat> the jet streams guide storms. Because of the warming, they're pushed further north than they'd normally be. So, you know, the Hadley cell goes further north. So they were not there to pull Harvey away from the coast. So hurricanes going ashore, if they don't, they lose the steering uh, winds and they just sort of plomp and just sit there. So Harvey stalled, went back out to sea, came back in, went back out, came back in, stalled out in forward motion because the jet streams were so far north. Harvey circled around, meandered, stayed in place day after day, moving a couple miles an hour, depositing huge amounts of water on the same area. A new phenomena for hurricanes, and guess what happens the very next year on the east coast of the U.S. this time? 
Hurricane Sandy came ashore. It was a complete surprise because it did a left turn, which is very odd. Storms always veer right in the northern hemisphere. The Earth's rotation, Coriolis force, deflection to the right. Sandy couldn't move north or east because of blocking patterns, high-pressure weather systems that get stuck in the jet stream configuration, also called high-pressure ridges. Just think of them as mountains of dry air, preventing storms from going into the space of high pressure. Sandy couldn't move north or east, had to move ashore. Uh, the guidance um, for Harvey um, kind of vanished, basically. It wasn't that there were so many ridges, it just didn't, there was no, no, nothing to move the storm. Um, for Florence, basically, uh, you know, the ridges were north. The, the ridges were, um, they were to the north of the storm. They were to the west and they were to the east. So the storms had boxed in. It could only move south a little bit when it found an opening or the ridges relaxed, etc. So, and don't forget the brown ocean effect, as I call it. Okay, what the heck's a brown ocean? Um, you know, apart from we're making it brown by all the crap we're pumping in, um, I'm talking about the land. Okay, so the land, when the ground's saturated with water, like as occurred in Texas, in other words, and also after the initial rains from Harvey, the soil pores are completely filled with water. There's no air. There could be no more water absorbed into the ground, so any additional rainwater becomes runoff or is pooled on the surface. When the water's pooled and the hurricane goes across, dumping huge amounts of water and causing flooding, instead of the hurricane seeing normal land and dissipating in strength, it saw water on top of the land. It could suck up that water vapor from the evaporation of water over the land and maintain its strength. That's why it's called, I call it the brown ocean event. Well, guess what's happening with uh, Hurricane Florence? Um, brown ocean event, right? The grounds, um, in, they had exceptional rains uh, recently um, in that region. So North Carolina, South Carolina, all those soils are very saturated. Um, so any rain fog falling on them is basically runoff. So it's going to be, you know, when we see the results of what happened, um, you know, when the camera crews get in and assess stuff, it's just going to be a horrendous catastrophe. Um, and it's actually even more brown ocean uh, because of all the uh, different, uh, res you know, can reservoirs of, of, of pig crap. You know, why, why are people so stupid, right? Why do, why do these companies, you know, that, that, pr that produce all that pig excrement, they can just store it in these things and you get a big rainfall and it's all going to overflow. It's just, uh, and it has in the past in some other storms. Okay, so... Sea level rise, of course, is happening because of rising temperature of the water mostly. Warm water expands. Because of the extremely high sea surface temperatures and water temperatures deep below in the Gulf, water expands. So the local sea level in the Gulf is higher. You know, add the global sea level rise of 3.5 millimeters per year onto that, and that figure is rapidly accelerating even more. Add a storm surge, a high tide, wave action from a huge storm, all these things add up. You get more flooding, and the risk from hurricanes becomes much greater. This was the case in Sandy, less the case in Harvey, because in Harvey, uh, most of the damage was from the torrential precipitation. With um, Florence, um, we're getting uh, the sea level rise along the eastern coast of the U.S. is larger than most places on the world um, because the Gulf Stream has slowed down and it's pushing up over the continental shelves and it's, um, that water is getting piled up against the shore. So it's even faster along the, the East Coast. Um, and of course, the South China Sea is much, much warmer than it should be. And that's going to mean that the, her the typhoon out there that crosses it is actually, you know, it's not going to lose strength. There's also dead zones in the ocean each year, the Gulf of Mexico and other places. So what's going to happen, you know, with uh, in, in Texas and Louisiana, you know, from Hurricane Harvey, all that water on land caused a, can cause a dip or stalling temporarily of global sea level rise because you've got huge amounts of water going from the ocean to land. We saw this a few years ago when there was huge rainfall over Australian parts of Asia. Sea level had a temporary stalling and drop, and then it accelerated at an even higher rate after to make up for that. Now... The dead zone in the Gulf was the largest it's been in a long time in 2017. Industrial and farming runoff, fertilizers. So imagine all that water sitting on the land in Texas carrying oil, chemicals, pesticides, fertilizer, nutrients. Running into the Gulf, it has to go there. 
size of the dead zone, watch out. And I haven't checked what it is. Um, check what it is yourself and maybe comment on the video. Uh, of course, uh, you know, all of the pig manure, if that goes into the rivers and also the coal ash, things are flooded. There's also nuclear plants in there. Um, 